Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandra Smith, and I'm the faculty chair of the program in criminal justice, the co-organizer of the PCJ speaker series, and the moderator for this afternoon's event. Before I begin our programming for I want to say tonight because it's getting so dark outside, but this, this afternoon, I'd like to invite all of you to join us again on December 6th for the final event of our speaker series entitled Envisioning and Enacting Abolitionist Futures, a screening and discussion of the documentary One Million Experiments, an experimental documentary film that explores how people are defining and creating safety to build a world without police and prisons. One Million Experiments showcases and celebrates people working to build solutions that are grounded in transformation instead of punishment through long form interviews with movement workers across the world. The screening will be followed by a conversation with organizers behind One Million Experiments project, Mariam Kaba and Eva Nagao. This promises to be an extraordinary event, challenging, thought provoking, insightful and inspiring. So please put it on your calendars and join us next week. Today, though, we're, we're having a conversation about um, some potential uh, critiques of uh, uh, abolitionist kind of frame of thinking, uh, abolitionist um, theory and praxis, and praxis. I'm going to start by sharing with you the, the results of a, of a recent poll by YouGov. Um, it asked uh, its uh, sample, what do Americans think of the current levels of incarceration and the living conditions inside prisons in the U.S. today? Um, the poll found that Americans were somewhat evenly split on the question, while just over one third or 36 percent said that the U.S. imprisons too many people. Twenty one percent said the U.S. imprisons just the right number and 24 percent reported that the U.S. Um, U.S. imprisons too few. A higher percentage of those who responded that the U.S. imprisons too many identified as Democrats, perhaps not surprisingly, they were under 30 years of age, maybe also not surprising, identified as Black um, and have been in prison or have had family members or friends who are also in prison. Um, despite the growing attention and interest in prison abolition, it seems from poll results like this, um, it seems clear that we have a ways to go in terms of of, of um, a fuller embrace of ab abolitionist kind of principles, ways of thinking and being. Those, even those advocating for fewer people in prison would not, likely not seek abolition or near abolition as um, their solution. So to better understand the challenges that the abolition movement faces, we've invited Professor Tommy Shelby to join us. In his most recent book, The Idea of Prison Abolition, Professor Shelby chronicles his journey of earnestly, seriously, and critically considering the major arguments in favor of prison abolition, including incarceration's ties to slavery, racism in the prison system, inequities in the criminal legal system more broadly, and exploitative control of the wider uh, prison industrial complex. As much as um, um, Professor Shelby's book ultimately offers a critique of prison abolition, it also um, it is also an invitation to readers to uh, and critics to take seriously abolitionist objectives to the practice of imprisonment, even if they don't agree. Professor Shelby's writings recognize that prisons are dehumanizing, unjust, and immoral, that they create the conditions that embed and entrench racism, enable political repression, and, and that justice demands sweeping change. Um, <clears throat> Today, he has joined us, um, thankfully, to uh, to describe or share with us what a value he finds in abolitionist thought and praxis, where he um, disagrees or departs um, from this uh, particular way of thinking and being, and where abolitionists and reformists could converge in addressing um, or redressing structural injustice and envisioning and building a, a radically transformed future. Uh, Tommy Shelby is the Caldwell Titcomb Professor in the Department of African American uh, African and African American Studies and the Department of Philosophy at Harvard University, where he has taught since 2000. He first became interested in philosophy and in the world of ideas more generally at Florida A&M University and earned his PhD in philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh. His newest book is The Idea of Prison Abolition, as we've said, which is based on a set of le lectures that he de uh, delivered um, at Princeton University in 2018. Uh, Professor Shelby is uh, has many books and many awards related to those books, but because I'm very uh, anxious and interested in getting started with this conversation, I'm going to leave it to you all to go to the website to check out all of the ways in, in which uh, Professor Shelby has, has been honored. Um, 
We are so incredibly fortunate to have Professor Shelby join us today to shape our thinking about potential barriers to an abolitionist future. Welcome, Professor Shelby. I'm going to call you Tommy from here on. And thank you so much again for joining us for um, this semester's long conversation. Really my pleasure. And thanks for inviting me. Glad to be in, in conversation with you, even if virtually. Even if virtually. Maybe sometime in the future we can do something face-to-face, -face, in person. Um, so let me start um, by saying or asking this question. Um, despite the fact that you have questioned the legitimacy of the criminal legal system in works like your, your uh, last book, Dark Ghettos, I'm sure that many were surprised that you would write a book length treatment of the question of prison abolition. So it would be great if we could, you could start the conversation or we could start this conversation. Um, if you'd share with our audience why you decided to write a book about prison abolition, why you decided to do so now, and what taking up abolitionist ideas as philosophy offers this conversation that might have been missing from previous de de or recent deba debates. Wonderful. Let me take a crack at it. Um, I mean, one way of thinking about why one might enter a, a conversation like this is just situated within, you know, general debates within not just Black studies, but in, in Black political life. You know, I, part of what I write about is history of political thought and what you find in looking at the history of debates amongst Black people in this country and elsewhere. Um, these debates are not just about, you know, what strategy to use, but often they're about what our fundamental aims should be, what, are, what are, should be our, our, our most basic aspirations and objectives as we try to struggle together to create a more just society and just world. And so you have these debates um, even during slavery, we have debates between people who said, no, what we need to do is get our people out of this out of this country and try to build something elsewhere. Other people thought, no, we should try to restructure society, create a real democracy, a real egalitarian society right, right here. You get similar debates during Black power. You got a mainstream, you know, uh, civil rights movement going on, trying to achieve certain kinds of things, trying to, you know, make the Constitution real, if you like. And then you have uh, radical uh, opponents and critics uh, some of them associated with black power, challenging those objectives, suggesting not just, again, not just disagreements about what strategy to use, um, but also about what should we ult ultimately be trying to achieve. So you could think of what I'm trying to do here is just in that same spirit. You have um, you know, a mainstream reform movement that's been going on for a while. You see a, a, a radical challenge um, by abolitionists to that mainstream project, suggesting it's it, it's not only limited, but maybe even be legitimizing injustice by suggesting that the criminal justice system as we know it is legitimate. And it's an appropriate challenge, it's an appropriate thing to take up. I think it's healthy for people, even black people, black people on the left and people who are interested in these questions to, to openly discuss and debate these issues, you know, in a charitable, open-minded spirit to think about what we should, what should we be trying to do, right? So that's kind of how I'm approaching it. I mean, it, it certainly fits within a, my broader scholarly interest as well. Um, I'm interested in a range of questions about uh, justice, racial justice, economic justice, criminal justice, kind of how they're related. Dark Ghettos takes up some of these questions. and But I didn't in that book, I was aware of the abolitionist challenge even in 2016 when I published that, but I, I didn't really take it up directly. And it seemed to me given so many people that I respect who were taking a strongly abolitionist position with respect to prisons and sometimes policing and surveillance in general, um, that it, it made sense to kind of think through, you know, for myself, you know, what should I think about this? So in a lot of ways, it's just coming out of things I've been thinking about for years um, and thought, well, here's a, this is a interesting challenge to my thinking maybe I should reconsider, you know? And uh, and so the book is kind of me thinking through the arguments that I that are prominent, especially arguments presented by, by Davis and people who are like-minded. Um, and so I wanted to, to engage that. Maybe I'll say one thing about philosophy is I, you know, am a philosopher, the contributions I make, they are, tend to be of that sort. Um, I mean, philosophy, I think could be useful here. I mean, a lot of the, the writings here are, being done by people who are, um, many of them activists, some of them scholar activists, some of them are coming from disciplines like history or the social sciences, um, not as much engagement coming from um, 
professional or academic philosophers um, outside of someone you know, prominent like Davis is part of the reason why I discuss her arguments in such detail. Um, but philosophy, you know, we, we it's kind of our in our you know disposition and our vocation. We gotta take up the radical idea. We take up the crazy thought. We're interested to challenge the most fundamental uh, assumptions that we're all walking around with. And so it seemed to me that philosophy has something to bring to it in that way, because so often people think of incarceration or prisons as just kind of natural feature of the world. How could we ever do without them? And sh surely to question them is an absurd thing to think. And But philosophers like to go in that territory and think about those kinds of questions. So I thought philosophy might be have something to say. It's also true that philosophers for a very long time um, have tried to think through the question of justification of punishment. And there are tons of debates in the vast literature thinking through, here's this practice of punishment. We've been around a long time. Um, what could possibly justify it? And there are a bunch of, you know, alternatives on the table. And I, you know, I'm familiar with that. I teach that material and thought about that material. And I thought, well, maybe that would be helpful to bring what I know about that to this debate about this particular form of punishment, of imprisonment, um, which isn't always focused on in the philosophical literature. And I guess one final thing I would say about the um, about this, I mean, I, I, I do operate from the premise that, you know, philosophical reflection has been in the past and can now help us think about, you know, what causes are really worthy of our acceptance, when should we join them? When should we abandon the ones that we had thought were good causes? And, and when should, in some cases, oppose a cause that we think is wrongheaded? And philosophers have taken that up on a bunch of different questions, whether that's abortion, multiculturalism, reproductive rights, uh, socialism, a bunch of different questions. And it's saying to me appropriate here as well to take up the question when we think about our most objective, most fun, our, our, our most fundamental aims in political life, is this a cause that's worthy of our joining? So these are sort of the reasons I decided to take it up. Uh, well, I appreciate um, that explanation so much. Uh, I, I do have follow-ups, but some follow-ups we'll do offline, um, some we'll do here. Um, in, in, in good part, the idea of prison abolition was your attempt to adjudicate essentially between two distinct approaches to addressing the massive injustices and harms of the criminal um, legal system in the U.S. A reform-centered approach, as you described, one that understands prisons um, and the criminal legal system in general as serving a legitimate function um, and seeks correction and to make it more effective and less harmful presumably within the context of broader criminal legal system reforms. And then there's the abolition-centered approach, which sees prisons as inherently dehumanizing and harmful and thus indefensible within the broader context of a punishment system that fails in almost every way to pre prevent harm, to effectively address harm that occurs, and or to address the conditions that lead to harm in the first place um, or that will lead to future harm in the future or lead to uh, further harm in the future. You make clear in the book um, early on that while you appreciate many of the critiques that abolitionists have leveled against the criminal legal system and prisons in particular, ultimately, you are not persuaded uh, that prison abolition is necessary. Given this, uh, I thought it might be great for you to share with our audience the extent and nature of reforms that you would like to see implemented because they are fairly vast, um, even if you would not feel comfortable going so far as abolition. Um, so if you could share with our audience the nature of reforms that you would like to see implemented in the criminal legal system in general and with prisons um, in particular, as well as what outcomes you hope those reforms might achieve. Yeah, a lot to say. Um, I won't try to say everything. I'll say I'll just say a few things. Um, they can read the book. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I don't like just give like, a you know, I, it's discussed throughout the book, various, you know, thinking about things, changes that, that seem a, a, appropriate to me. Um, maybe just take one step back up, about the, the, the framing, re reform abolition framing, just a, a bit to kind of, so... So this is not this is not a framing I think I'm bringing to the to the debate. I mean, I, I feel others. I mean, I, I sort of feel like it's partly the challenge of abolition to re reformers that, that leads to this framing of 
defending it, defending uh, a, a reform orientation against these objections is not so much that I think that's necessarily the best way to frame it, but it's just kind of how the debate has unfolded. Um, another thing I would say is, um, you know, I don't think that a focus on reforming prisons or even the criminal legal system more broadly is likely to be terribly effective without sort of broader structural transformation, right? So you, sometimes I think when people think of a person who advocates reform that they think, you know, that the background social system is basically just, and we just need to make incremental improvements to the criminal justice system. That's not what I think at all. I think it's very unlikely that you're gonna avoid many of the problems that those of us concerned about mass incarceration are concerned with if you just tinker with the criminal justice system because it's situated within a broader social structure that is marred by great injustices and are lots of different domains. Um, and so my book, Dark Ghettos, is largely trying to think through some of that. Um, so just to, just to be, me to be under, I wanna be understood correctly that I don't, I'm not just treating the, the status quo as kind of a thing that's not to be questioned and just, you know, let's just focus on reform the criminal justice. I don't think that. Um, so some of the things I might advocate would likely be more effective if you could make some background changes, if you didn't have like this high concentration of wealth, great in inequality, a really um, meager, stingy welfare state and, all, and so on and so forth, right? If you didn't, that much your situation, uh, then some of these reforms I think would be much more effective. Uh, not to say they're not worth trying to do anyway, but I think you can. You, you, we should expect them to be per, pretty limited in against the background of those larger in, structural injustices. That said, I mean some of the things that I would say. Uh, well, one I would certainly say is that you know improving prison conditions is obviously vital, urgent matter, but not sufficient to address the kind of broader question of a criminal legal system because they go way beyond prison conditions. You might think, I mean, when I think about the kinds of reforms, I mean, one could just look to see, you know, in a lot of ways, the Vera Institute for Justice probably speaks for me on many issues. So like, one could go and look and look at all the things they suggest. And almost, I'm mostly, I don't always agree with them about diagnosis, but I, I often agree with them about, you know, what to do. Um, so one could one could look there. Some of the things that would make sense, you, you, you can't just focus on prison conditions, you got to focus on things that happened prior to people in, in, entering to prison, whether that's bail reform, you know, I'm of a, the thought that, you know, we, we really shouldn't rely on um, bail uh, as, a, as, as, as kind of detention prior to hearing or trial. Um, you know, if you need to incarcerate people for detention because they, you, you have really strong reasons to believe that they're a danger to the community, that's one thing. Quite another to just just to ensure that they'll show up for court. <laughs> well, I don't think you really need to incarcerate people to, to ensure that. Certainly not currently, because it's very hard to evade <laughs> um, having to go to court. Um, so, I, I, sentencing reform, obvious thing. You know, we we our sentences are just way too long um, to possibly be justified. I think um, you compare us to uh, you know a lot of. Uh, Western, Western, Northern European countries, and our sentences are just like dramatically longer than than, and that seems unnecessary, unnecessary kind of suffering, and probably counterproductive in, in a lot of ways. Um, there's a problem with the power of prosecutors, more or less unchecked power to pile up charges against people, use that as a leverage to kind of get them to to take pleas that are really unfavorable. We have very little checks on that. Um, you know, there's this ensuring legal, adequate legal counsel for everybody, especially people who don't have, um, have much money, um, in addition to other due process measures that are rather they're troubling. Obviously, the police are needlessly violent and arbitrary in how they go about their business. One could go on at length about that. But there are some things about the prison itself, which is really the focus of the book, um, you know, that if you just, you can draw on what uh, some other societies do. We don't, we're not like operating, you know, we don't need to operate from scratch. Um, we we know that things will be better if you don't have tiny cells with, that, that people are are in. Um, be better if these were uh, single occupancy cells. Um, be better if you didn't have general problems of overcrowding in, in, in the prisons. You know, we know that 
you know, you have to ensure things like proper ventilation and heating and cooling. You know, you, people have, need access to natural light and to fresh air. You got to make sure sanitation is, a, is at, a, at a high standard so you don't have spread of disease and, and so on, right? You, you know, you have to facilitate visitation. For pe people need to stay connected to their communities, to their loved ones. And there are lots of ways to do that. And we don't really work very hard at ensuring that. And when we do, we, it's, we pile up the cost on prisoners to, to make that possible. People need libraries, they need access to education and vocational training. You know, we know we way overuse solitary confinement. And of course, there's like, you know, really intrusive um, action on the part of for-profit corporations throughout the system that is a troubling feature of, of it. Um, and of course, there, you know, you, there's what happens when people are released. So, you know, you got on the front hand, you got due process issues, you got what happens in the prison, then people are released. And like, if you, if you don't have reentry conditions aren't appropriate, then people are going to end up back, back in. Um, that partly requires rehabilitation services inside, which in most states um, and in the federal system, there's very limited opportunities for effective rehabilitation services and for help with people who have um, substance abuse problems or have mental health problems, very little help for them there. You could do more on that front. And you could do more in, from the way the community receives the people when they come back to society, right? So if you everyone's stigmatized and you, you won't let them live near you, you won't work with them, you don't allow them to go to school, then what you know what can you expect, right? Um, so there's a lot to be done on reentry, just preparing people for reentry, and having society that's, that's willing to accept those who've been in prison back on equal terms as members of the community. So there's lots to be done. These are difficult things to do. Um, but these are at least are among the things that I think it would make sense to do. And again, I think, you know, there are societies that do many of these things a lot better than we do. And, and, and we can, I think, learn from them. I appreciate that very long list. I mean, that to, to do almost any, like any, uh, part of that would require what feels like a kind of transformation. So it almost makes me want to jump to the question, why wouldn't you want to abolish it, given that you've essentially said we need to uh, do major overall overhauls at every point in this uh, in this system. But I'll get to that question um, a little bit later. I'm, I first want to just kind of follow up on something that you said a little earlier, and this might uh, you might not be in a place where you'd want to respond to this, but you did suggest that you thought that there were better ways to frame this discussion or debate, that maybe the kind of reform versus abolition isn't the best way to go. And if you were starting this conversation, maybe you would do it differently. Um, can you share what you were thinking there? I'm, I'm very curious. Sure. sure. I mean, one way would be, you know, won't surprise you, philosopher, want to make a distinction, um, uh, is to distinguish sort of two questions that aren't always distinguished in these debates. So, so one question is really about our kind of ultimate aims. Um, and here you could think of the abolition question as a question about whether um, the practice of imprisonment is compatible with a just society. That's a kind of question you could have, right? It's a question, it's not just a philosopher's question, you know, um, many socialists would raise a similar question about capitalism. They formulate in exact, structurally the same way. Is capitalism compatible with a just society? And there you're gonna raise a bunch of questions about whether there's any way of structuring capitalism that would be compatible with, with justice, right? So if you think about Marx's writings, you know, something like capital, like part of what he's trying to do, and he's trying to do many things in capital. One thing he's trying to do in capital is explain why it's in the nature of the capitalist system that um, it will always be a form of uh, dehumanizing um, uh, despotic exploitation, right? It's just like built into the system. And even if you made various changes in it and so on, that's going to be enough. That's part of what he's trying to argue in, in capital. So there's a similar question here about, about abolition, right? So is it is the practice of imprisonment, no matter how we structure it, kind of inherently unjust? It just can never be compatible with justice. So that's one kind of question you could have. Then there's a question about, um, you know, what to what to do now um, when you know that you're not in a position to bring about the kind of structural transformation that would 
constitute a just society? And what kinds of things should you do, right? Um, so I, I think sometimes these questions are not, are not separated in the way I think they they ought to be. And I think, you know, so you you might think, so I would say some people might think what we, the response to grave systemic injustice is something like a kind of moratorium. Why, why do I describe it that way? I want to distinguish it from thinking that the practice of imprisonment is always, wherever, under any conditions, unjust and dehumanizing. That position, I think, is strong. I think not correct. Um, from thinking that the prison system, as we know it, under these unjust conditions, is, is so unjust that we should either not use it until we can create more unjust circumstances, or we should use it in very limited ways until we could create more unjust. So I sort of think that some of what when people are speaking of abolition, because often they're really focused on the U.S. context, um, it's probably better described as something like a moratorium position or something something like that. Not some moratorium on building new prisons. Some people advocate, but a, a moratorium on the use of, of imprisonment as the way to try to prevent and control crime, to try to not use or just use it in very limited way. And there's a version of that that I actually would accept. Um, of a moratorium position that, you know, until you can create much more just background conditions, that we really should limit our use of incarceration to really the most serious sorts of crimes, the kinds of crimes that cause kind of irre great irreparable damage. Um, and in other cases, we rely on other ways of kind of, of, kind of hand handling it. So I would probably frame it more like that. And so th th there's that, that broader question, philosophical question of, is this a practice that could never be just, can never be compatible with injustice? Um, and a lot of the book is taking that up, yeah. as you might imagine. Um, and, and then there's the question of if you thought, even, you know, whatever you, however you answer that question, it's still going to be a question of what your process should be toward the practice as, as it currently exists in a place like the U.S. Appreciate that uh, response very much. Um, so in the book, you rightly point out that one, cannot adequately adjudicate between the reform-centered and abolitionist-centered approaches without really engaging with debates about um, the role that punishment plays. So you write, if anything justifies, um, what if anything justifies penalizing someone for breaking the law? You then discuss the difference between retribution and deterrence. Can you share what role you see um, for both, um, both from an, a reformist perspective and then explain for both uh, retribution and deterrence from a reformist perspective and then explain why and how punishment used to deter ends up being a central factor in your considerations? Let me try. Um, I mean, one thing to say off the top is I think when a lot of people hear the word punishment, they think that retribution has to be somehow bound up with it. So part of what I want to suggest is that that's not correct, that punishment in one sense, which is just the penalty that you impose for a legal infraction, you could do that for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. um, not just to kind of to, as a form of retribution. So people mean many things by retribution. Um, so let me just kind of give it like how I think of how I think of it. Um, I think of it as sort of committed to sort of four a retributive this about punishment is contributed to sort of four claims. Let me try to I'll be really quick about what I think they are. The first claim I think is that uh, those who are guilty of wrongdoing, they deserve to suffer some deprivation whether that's their liberty, their possessions, perhaps even their lives, right? It's the first claim, a dessert claim. Retributivists also think that the, the guilty should suffer in proportion to the moral depravity of their wrongful acts. So the more blameworthy, the more they should be made to suffer. They also tend to think that the, the suffering that's imposed on the guilty is something that we do not so much to prevent crime, but because it's it's intrinsically good. I mean, justice requires that they that they pay in some sense, right? that, that the suffering is has a value apart from any beneficial social consequences that might flow from it. It's just that they they should suffer some deprivation because they did this this wrong thing. Those who do evil um, should endure this suffering. 
and that could be sufficient to justify the practice in some in some people's minds if they're retributivists. And then finally, I think there's the thought that um, uh, a legitimate state has the authority and the responsibility to ensure that those who commit crimes suffer in the way that they deserve. So take that as retributive. That's kind of what I mean, those four claims. And mm -hmm. I don't think any of them are true. Um, so how do I think about it? Um, I mean, we could talk about retributivism all day, but but I mean, <laughs> uh, let me compare it to another approach. So you could just think that, well, why have a system of punishment that includes incarceration? Why why have, why do that? What, what could justify it? And I think it's gotta be that it helps us to um, prevent control crime. That's the reason why we would do it. And then the question is, well, what role could incarceration play in doing that? And there, I think probably three roles. Um, one role just has to do with just discouraging people from committing crimes. That's the deterrence part. The general deterrence part is just, you set up a system where you announce, don't do these things, well, this will be the penalty. And that's meant to discourage people from doing it. That's, you know, if you if you move outside the realm of imprisonment to other things, it seems, you know, in, in, a, in a way, uh, an obvious way to respond to certain kinds of rule breaking, right? So we, you know, we, we don't want people to drive recklessly on the highways. People die when you do that. So a lot of people are inclined to do that for fun. You know, maybe they're sleeping, maybe they've been drinking, who knows? We try to discourage it with penalties. We say, look, if you do that, we, you know, we're going to punish you. If you do it bad enough, we might impose even incarceration, depending on which, how reckless you are. Um, so we try to discourage certain kinds of things. That's what a general deterrence is about. Um, we can talk about special deterrence later if you want. That uh, I'm not a, fan, uh, not a fan of it, uh, but put that to one side. Incarceration could presumably also help in cases where some people are just not going to be deterred. Some people, despite the fact that there's a penalty there for whatever reason, they don't respond to it and they do the thing anyway. And if it's bad enough, then you might think incarceration is the appropriate response to incapacitate them, incapacitate them so they don't um, do continue to do behave in that way. And then the third way in which incarceration might help with preventing or helping to control crime is... Um, with rehabilitation, what you do while while you're holding them. So um, if you know you have general deterrence, it fails, so you impose the penalty as a way to uh, make the whole system credible. Um, sometimes you have to incapacitate people because they just won't be deterred. But while you're holding them, it makes sense to try to provide them with the services they need so that when they leave, they won't continue to act in the same ways. So I take it that three-prong approach of general deterrence, incapacitation, and rehabilitation is kind of what imprisonment, the role it could play in, in helping to prevent prevent crime. So that's kind of how I how I think of it. There are numerous other theories about how you justify a practice like, like this, but this is the way that, that I would, would, would try to justify it. Okay, uh, that's very helpful and we'll allow us to kind of move into the next set of questions. Um, I'd like uh, to take some time to discuss each of the following points that you make um, about uh, um, how it is that people might determine whether or not they are reformers or abolitionists where prison is concerned. Um, so I'm going to go through the list of four, but I'd like to take each um, separately. One point that you make uh, or thing that you think that we should be looking at is whether or not we believe that imprisonment has a legitimate goal that would justify its inherent costs and risks. The second is whether criminal justice rules can be devised to fairly and effectively achieve this goal, because we know that it does not do that now, but can it be made to? Um, the third is whether sufficient personnel can be recruited, trained, and relied upon to impartially, impartially and consistently follow these rules. And the fourth, you say, is whether there's a practically achievable alternative set of practices that could secure the same goals, but with fewer harmful or costly consequences. So if there are these alternatives, one imagines you think one can go the abolitionist, uh, abolitionist route. So let's start with the 
first um, and where you, how this is contributed to where you ended up landing with regards to abolition versus reform, whether imprisonment has a legitimate goal that would justify its inherent costs and risks. I think in answering this, you would essentially be kind of elaborating on the last point that you made. So can you speak to this um, now? Yeah, I mean, the thought is that if the rights violation is severe enough, um, then you can be justified in taking fairly drastic measures in, in response to try to prevent it. Um, so when it's uh, a violation of people's rights that would lead to great and irreparable harm or lasting trauma, then I think you can be justified in taking fairly drastic measures to try to prevent it. And so that goal of prevention is the one that justifies justifies it. Uh, if it, um, so it is partly a matter of deterrence, general deterrence, um, but also I would emphasize uh, uh, partly sometimes people can't be deterred and have to be incapacitated at least for a limited period of time. And hopefully while that's happening, they're receiving in prison services that might help them to be released and be able to rejoin us as, as, an, as an equal. Yeah. So with regards to that, here are a couple of uh, thoughts or questions that came up for me as I was reading this. Um, <clears throat> a lot of, so there are a whole host of offenses that you think should just not even, people should not be punished by being incarcerated, the low level nonviolent, just not even brought into the system in this way. So you're real, really focused on what you describe as the most serious or severe kind of offenses, murders, rapes, et cetera. Um, many of which we could, I think we could, it, they happen more than we want to, but they're relatively rare given some of the, what, what happens on the low end. Um, when I think about offenses like rapes, for instance, and, and I think about this question of de deterrence, the overwhelming majority of rapes that happen never get reported. No, we never find out about them. Um, and even among those that do get reported, often the response from law enforcement is not really very positive. And even if you go to the, the, the point where someone goes to trial, often it, there's no conviction. <clears throat> um, and so one wonders about the deterrent effect of crimes that fall into these, in, in, into these categories, because we know Rapes might be extraordinary in that maybe it's more likely that folks don't find out about, we never find out about those kinds of offenses. But the case, the truth of the matter is for the vast, probably majority of crimes, we never learn anything about. Um, and a lot of them, even if you did, there, there's no, the, the criminal legal system doesn't address it in, in ways that bring about. And so it's hard to imagine. So I'm wondering about this argument about deterrence in a context where so few crimes get reported. And even if it gets into the system, often the result is not one that one could argue would reasonably have someone who might end up engaging in these kinds of acts say, well, I'm not going to do this. So you, you see what I'm, my, my concern is, should, if we care about rape, it seems like we should be trying to deal with that problem um, in a whole different kind of, like we need a very different paradigm to deal with. Incarceration is not going to do that. It's not, I'm not sure that incarceration is doing anything for us with regards to a whole set of offenses, many of which fall into this category. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be, this might actually have been the place where I got most stuck in, um, mm -hmm. in, in the reading of the book and thinking about the role that prisons might play in deterrence, especially when we think about how relatively few crimes ever get on the radar of law enforcement. So it means that those just don't get responded to, at least not by the state. And then even when it does, there are these other issues that emerge. Is So, so that to me suggests right there, the failure of incarceration to do the very thing that you're suggesting that it does. I mean, there's questions even if it did succeed, but, but mm -hmm. it does seem to be a poor instrument um, to do what it is that you're describing it might do in this situation. And so I'm wondering, am, yeah, how you would respond to that? Like, am I missing something there? I don't know that I would disagree with anything you said. I mean, um, I think it's not a particularly effective <clears throat> instrument for um, deterring 
sexual assaults um, of the most common variety, certainly. Um, so I don't know that I would go so far as to say it doesn't discourage anyone. I mean, I mean, part of the difficulty with this is that, you know, we we know of the cases where people actually weren't deterred. <laughs> Um, it's, we don't know the cases where they where, where where they were. It's harder to 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 isolate the cases where they were. The terrible people might have done something, but they um, but they didn't because they knew um, that that they could be could be great penalties for it. So it's in, in the book. I try to allow that this is the strongest argument I think abolitionists have. That is that it's very hard to show that. Uh, imprisonment uh, is an effective general deterrent. Um, and you have to kind of, you try to piece together the evidence that I try to review the evidence that, I, that I'm that i aware of and look look through that to try to figure out that. Is there reason to think that some of, some of it's empirical considerations, some of theoretical considerations to see why you might think that some people who are, you know, law-abiding as it were, um, have been at least in part discouraged from breaking the law because of the presence of this, this system. Um, but I agree, it's like there are probably better things to do. Um, and we, sh we should try to do those things. People are trying to do those things, experimenting with those things. Maybe we'll talk about that too. I'm experimenting with other things you might do with that. I'm a little, I, I feel somewhat different about homicide. Um where I think it's kind of, it's like really important to try for obvious reasons to prevent people from killing other people. Um, and there, I guess I, I am inclined to, to think that there is some evidence to suggest that um, there's some general deterrent effect. Um, we, we could talk about that. This is not, my, I'm not an expert on this. I'm partly relying on what I read and what I want to talk to my criminology friends, what they say I should read. <laughs> Um, I was criminology friends. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> some of them that. are your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> even more so. Um, but yeah, no, to that, but to, even to that point though, Tommy, when I think about murder, um, at least, okay, so let's focus on the Black community where we could argue that rates of violence are higher. Um, police solve what? 25% of murders done in the Black community. I mean, it's relatively low. And I would bet that a good percentage of the folks that they bring into the system for murder are probably the wrong folks. Um, so so even in cases where one went, where it's way higher than we would want it to be, um, and where probably more attention needs to be paid in, in order to address what is a real issue, uh, law enforcement fails uh, to to identify the folks who do the harm, and it's not quite clear that incarcerating um, huge percentages of, of of the black population in some communities has stopped murders from happening. Um, I'm not quite sure that I've seen that evidence, and I know I think um, I'm trying to remember. I think it's a uh, Sable and a colleague who have a recent review in the annual review, I think of criminology, where they show, um, I mean, they rely on the outcome of recidivism, which I know you wanted to stay away from, but they show that incarceration doesn't uh, help reduce recidivism at all. People are going back into the system constantly. Not necessarily just about individuals' behavior. I think the system is engaging with people who've been in the system in a particular way that drives up um, 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 further contact, but it does suggest here again that incarceration, a fear of incarceration is not necessarily, um, uh, it's not quite clear to me how much of a deterrent that is. And that's aside from the fact that so many cases where, where someone is killed, that happens to be a kind of spontaneous, got into a fight and, you know, things got out of control and, and, you know, some, it ended badly. Um, so many of the circumstances are like that um, in context, context that probably are uh, where the, more violence probably occurs. And so, so it does make me wonder here again, if a lot of killings happen in that context and in those ways, um, and even in situations where they do happen, police do a really bad job of identifying who they are, especially when it happens in Black communities, is incarceration or the threat of it really doing the work that 
um, you would want it to do in terms of of reducing it. And maybe you're right. Maybe the counterfactual is that the rates would be so much higher if incarceration didn't exist, but it really doesn't seem like that is doing the work that we would want to, um, to reduce rates of that kind of harm. Um, so, so I, I would want to think about it, but I, I get based on the things that I've been reading, it makes me, it, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical that that here again, that that is the case and that a lot of the things that you said earlier about dealing with what is happening in communities, uh, investing in communities, um, will probably go a long way towards addressing these. Uh, so anyway, let me move to the second, the second point, and I promise we'll get through this, um, the final set of points quickly, so that folks can begin to answer, get their questions answered. So, and just so the audience knows, start to drop your questions in the queue or put your hands up, so that when um, I am uh, done having this conversation with Tommy, you all can jump in as well. The second thing that you said that we should take into consideration is whether the criminal justice rules can be devised to fairly and effectively achieve this goal. And I'm actually going to add to ask you to do two at one time. In addition to that one, whether sufficient personnel can be recruited, trained, and relied upon to impartially and consistently follow rules. Can you tackle those two what would it look like to to what would the answers have to be here to to go in the route uh, or direction of abolition versus reform? Right. Well, I mean, maybe one thing to say here is like is, is just reiterate something I said earlier, which is um, you know, you know, I agree with a lot of abolitionists that you wouldn't be able to um divide, even if you could devise abstractly principles and policies that are fair and effective kind of in the abstract, um, you still need people to carry it out. And if those people can't be trusted to carry it out in a consistent and impartial way, you're going to end up with a lot of bad results, right? Um, so part of what I want to say is something I've been agreeing with abolitionists that, look, I mean, you can't expect to have an effective criminal justice system that's focused on crime prevention and control against the background of greed, systemic injustice, right? I think you just can't expect that. So I agree that, you know, if, as a lot of people have reported for, you know, for now for decades now, that look, if you, you're living in a certain circumstances, you ain't gonna be afraid of prison, right? Um, and if you're released back into those certain circumstances, you are likely to act in similar ways, maybe worse. Uh, so I don't, don't want to disagree with any of that, that I think that that's right. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you, you're you not going to be able to bring about the con these kinds of changes when there's just such grave racial, economic, gender-based injustice that just, just that's mar things so much. You got concentrated disadvantages in, our, in and around our cities. You know, and there, and there you have high, very high um, rates of violence and and, and homicide. Uh, so I, I would agree, you're not, you're unlikely to be able to. And if, of course, if you release people and you don't, they have no supports. They've already probably went in with limited education and and and, and skills. What are you going to expect? So I, so so part of what I do is I try to try to think a little more broadly about, you know, other places um, who seem to have much more success. They they have lower recidivism rates. They have they're, they're closed more their cases when there's murders and so on, and just um, have less crime. There's also um, a problem that's in some ways peculiar to, to the U.S., um, which is our gun problem, um, which other people don't have. So it's that presents special difficulties um, when you have so much of your uh, civilian citizenry um, armed, sometimes armed with really pretty serious weaponry, military grade weaponry sometimes. And then expecting the police to try to, to re respond to that. So there's special things here. And I don't, so, so again, I want to, I want to step back. There is a broader question of, you know, could the practice of imprisonment achieve these objectives under the right kinds of conditions? And I want to say we have some reason to think that it could. It's limited. Uh, it's a limited response. And there are many other things that probably would, um, uh, and can and should play a role in trying to prevent crime, and I and I would support those things too. So it's like it's one tool. Probably shouldn't be our first, the first thing we go to, 
Uh, but it maybe it's there a useful thing to go to as a kind of backup when other things fail is kind of how I how I think about it. Thank you very much for that. Um, and so final of the four, and then the, my final question after that, what you point out that uh, our decision about abolition versus reform should also hinge on whether there's a uh, practically achievable alternative set of practices that could secure the same goal, but with fewer harmful or costly consequences. And this question too, to me is important because it leads into our discussion about uh, abolition and practice and theory in general. So, so how, where do you stand on that? What, what, do, what is your thinking here that led you towards um, reform as opposed to abolition? I mean, part of it was the thinking that many of the, oh, sorry about that. My um, phone should not be ringing. <laughs> um, um, many of the things that abolition suggests as alternatives didn't strike me as um, the things that are really mutually exclusive. Like if, you know, they seem to me things that we should do, but it didn't require getting rid of the criminal justice system to do them. So yeah, people need access to services that help them deal with their substance, substance abuse um, disorders. People need mental health care. Um, people um, need not to be poor. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's lots of things. There are lots of things that it makes sense that to to do. There are many of the uh, restorative justice measures people suggest also seem to me not, uh, they don't preclude the, the use of the criminal justice system. We should do those too. We should still and it should often be an alternative. Some people don't want to go, as you mentioned earlier, they don't want to enter into the criminal justice system, um, people who've been, been harmed by other people's wrongdoing. And there are other ways you might respond to that. You might think, well, maybe some way, some other form of accountability um, that involves acknowledgement, apology, reparations that are voluntarily given. Maybe that these would be appropriate things to to do. It would be better things to do. Uh, other ways of intervening before conflicts happen, try to resolve them, and so on. There are lots of things we could do, but they don't seem to me to to be uh, alternatives in the sense that you you couldn't do that and have a criminal justice system. Um, so I actually favor a lot of the things. Um, the abolitionists put forward as things to to do, they would say instead, I would say alongside of, um, reliance on a criminal legal system were that system sufficiently fair and effective. So that's that's sort of how I think about it. I mean, I do think that some, maybe people think that they're incompatible if they, re if they reject the idea of that um, uh, that, that prisons could be just. So if you think that the practice of imprisonment is intrinsically wrong and unjust, and that's gonna, you know, that gives you a different outcome, right? But if you, um, so again, like that, there's always two parts. There's the, the, is it intrinsically wrong question and is it ineffective? And there's the two, the two pieces, right? So you, if, if you thought that, I think that it's not inherently unjust, and we can talk about why, why I think that if you want, um, it could be made to be just, though it, existing practice in place like the U.S. is often unjust, um, and while often ineffective, could be made to be to be to be effective. Um, so that's sort of how I think about it. I mean, I think, you know, if you take something concrete like reparations, right? So some people are harmed, and people who favor restorative justice, they want the people who participate in those processes to participate voluntarily. It's like a part of it, right? Um, but it also seems to me that, I mean, we often, uh, through the criminal legal system, require restitution for, for wrongs, and it's not voluntary. It's required. Um, and that can be helpful to people. It can be helpful to have resources to recover from the harms. Um, uh, and, and that help, that re recovery from those harms, um, maybe it would be better if, if that help were voluntarily given as opposed to forcibly extracted. But it can still be helpful, so I don't see those as as as, as incompatible. The, the the leveraging of state power to ensure restitution or, rep or reparation um, uh, alongside of accountability measures that may be more informal, community based, and voluntary. No, I think that that uh, that makes sense. Um, 
I have, as I pointed out, a couple more questions, but I do want um, folks in the audience to be able to get and ask their questions. Um, it looks like Kaya Stern, who I, my, I, my understanding is that you know um, fairly well, has a question for you. I'm wondering if Kaya would like to um, uh, unmute and ask her own question. Uh, Kaya, are you interested in doing that? Sure, thank you. I am sorry for sending it in the chat before and distracting. Thank you so much for, for this conversation. And um, Tommy, you mentioned the overuse of solitary confinement. And I'm just curious if, and if so, what part of forced isolation um, makes sense to you in terms of justice? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um... So if you think of the, you know, a prison as a kind of little city, um, there are rules and regulations within it too. And sometimes um, people won't comply with them. And you do need, um, you know, sometimes you'll need to um, penalize or incapacitate people within, the, within that context. So for the, for the same reason, we sometimes need to incapacitate people um, to prison because of the threat they pose to the general public. Sometimes a, a, a prisoner can pose a threat to someone inside um, the prison, whether that's another prisoner or, or staff or medical personnel and what have you. Um, I don't think uh, uh, that isolation should go on like it does for sometimes many, many years um, and, and, and have with such limited time outside of the cell, but I don't see a practical alternative to sometimes limited uses of isolation to prevent harm to other prisoners or to, to prison staff um, if you're dealing with a particularly violent individual. You'd have the same sort of issue in the context of a psychiatric hospital um, where you will have individuals um, because of their psychological maladies are such that they pose a, a serious threat to others and, and they will have to sp have spend periods of time um, in isolation, especially if they want, they refuse to take the medication. Um, uh, I don't think that that's um, inherently wrong or, de or dehumanized to do it. I think it's a, it's a sort of a practical necessity to prevent harm to to the people who shouldn't be liable to that 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 harm. Um, though I certainly agree that it's it's widely overused and people spend way too much time um, isolated. Thank you. <clears throat> so while we wait for um, others who might jump in, I'm going to th uh, throw out one of my uh, other questions uh, for you, um, um, Tommy. While reading um, an idea or the idea of prison abolition, I was wondering to what extent um, abolitionists might become frustrated with your discussion with kind of aspects of their approach. Because while I think there was a... Um, really um, clear and uh, thoughtful discussion about like the nature of kind of structural changes that uh, an abolitionist or the, the movement itself might seek. Um, there wasn't much in my mind, and maybe I missed this, a uh, discussion of the, the cultural one, like the, hmm. the beliefs that undergird the, the, the uh, systemic changes that they imagine, uh, and maybe I should say we, I guess, on some level, um, and um, and and so that you get a it, there's a much more holistic view of what folks are after. So it's not just let's uh, eliminate prisons. There's a there's this cultural element that gets missing. So um, so I, I think the ways in which some folks have described it is this kind of simple one for one replacement, swapping out prisons for RJ practices or uh, or something like that, without a kind of deeper consideration for the the uh, for changing the broader community um, um, ecosystem um, changes that are both cultural and structural, um, broadly conceived. So of course the, the structural would be, you know, creating these paths, um, toward major changes in how we distribute resources such that we are investing heavily in systems of care and accountability, but undergirding that these structural transformations, my understanding is at least, and maybe I have this wrong, is a kind of a major cultural project, one where 
we center values and principles of interdependence on, you know, so we rely on each other and we, you know, we should individuals intrinsic worth, healing and rehabilitation, of course, restorative justice practices to address harm. Um, you, you want us to focus a lot of attention on harm prevention and being proactive, but I think abolitionists are also thinking in terms of harm prevention, um, in terms of uh, making it so that there are fewer victims uh, or people who end up being survivors, um, kind of holistic well-being and uh, equity and inclusivity. Like these are like a, a set of real principles and and th these ways of thinking and being with each other. So as individuals and as members of community and, and how to create stronger bonded communities where we rely on each other we uh, to solve problems and to move ahead together. Like that felt missing and that seemed to to me to be a part of this broader um, ecosystem that they're trying to create within which the abolition of or elimination of prisons and other parts of the criminal or the criminal legal system in general is understood to happen that you can eliminate that but but what you have in its place what we have in its place is each other essentially in strong relationships trying to figure out how to solve problems in ways that are probably difficult and will take a long time but develops a kind of a kind of collective efficacy and social cohesion that many communities lack and so i I, I don't know this for sure, but I wondered if there wouldn't be a, a great deal of frustration on the part of abolitionists and in, in that that kind of cultural undergirding seems to be missing in your discussion. And so then it ends up feeling like this, well, let's just get rid of it and do RJ instead, or let's you know do this or that, but not a part of this kind of holistic uh, a major transformation of society in, 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 altogether that uh, includes this major cultural element. Um, am I missing something um, in that? In that, uh... I think it's probably fair to say I don't talk as much about the cultural transformation as opposed to the structural transformation part. Um, it's probably fair. I do. I like to think that I'm um, emphasize how welcome I, uh, I regard uh, a range of experiments to try to find ways, less harmful ways of of dealing with, um, you know, certain kinds of wrongful um, actions. Um, I think it's better if you could find a way to uh, prevent the kind of great harm I think is important to prevent if you didn't have, without relying on incarceration or policing, I think it would be much better, you know? So I'm all, all in favor of experimenting and try to find alternatives that would um, uh, lead us to have to rely less or maybe even not at all, if you, could, you know? I, I suppose, um, you know, maybe what I'm, what the, the lack of attention to the cultural is maybe is a, partly for social theoretic reasons that have to do with, you know, how I think about modern societies. So um, sociologists, you know, uh, there's like a huge debate about, you know, about like, is modern society is different? You know, it's not like a small community or village, right? I mean, it's a mass society of strangers. It's very diverse, people from all different kinds of groups. Um, you can expect a wide range of of values, value commitments in that in any such society. And if the society is to be a free one, um, you, you it's not reasonable to expect a, a great convergence, you know, around certain values about how we ought to relate to one another. We do have law, and law kind of sets the boundaries of how we ought to treat one another. Um, but you can expect there to be a wide range of views about what makes for a meaningful life, what makes for meaningful relationships with one another, what's how to understand, how to think about community and its value. Uh, so I, I would expect that in any in any large modern society to to have that kind of variety, and I'm maybe somewhat skeptical that we know how to make the kind of cultural transformation that would lead people to share the the kind of the the kind of values that you, some of the, some of the ones you were kind of articulating. Um, uh, and it still be a free one, 
that is, you don't do that through modes of repression. Uh, so I think that's kind of to be expected to, that there's going to be that. And I don't know that it's reason to expect that the kind of thick sense of community that some people favor to be pervasive and uh, and, and embraced by, by all, all one's fellow citizens. Um, so maybe there is a note of skepticism there uh, about, you know, how will we do that? It's, not, it's just not clear to me how you bring about that kind of cultural shift. There is a cultural shift I think is absolutely critical to bring about, um, which is to try to delegitimize retribution as a, as a, as a justification for punishment, is to try to fight back the tendency to think that that people just deserve to suffer because they did this wrong thing, which I don't think can really be defended except on sectarian grounds. So uh, I do think you have to kind of get people, even though there will be people who will believe it, because I think in a plural society, they will. And many people, because of their religious beliefs, they will accept that that's the correct view. And it will be wrong to try to repress them. They will, they, they're going to think that. But that doesn't mean you need to set up your criminal justice system to embody that view that retribution is an appropriate response. I think it's important for us to fight against the thought that that value system should be embodied in criminal law. And if that requires a cultural shift to bring that about, then I certainly will be, be, be all in favor of it. Okay. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. And so I'm hoping that we can get through them before our time is up, or we might just have to keep you for a couple extra minutes on me. Um, <laughs> so uh, one question is by George Hutchins. George, do you want to ask your question or you, do you want me to do so? I, I can ask, can, can you hear me? I was having some tech difficulties. I can hear you, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, well, first, thank you, Professor Shelby. I've had the chance to hear a few of your um, talks about this book, so this is very interesting. Um, this is more just of a clarification question, because um, it seems like here you're arguing for sweeping and substantial reforms really at all levels of the carceral system. I mean, you mentioned physical spaces to even, you know, gesturing towards um, rethinking ideological underpinnings. And I'm wondering what exactly should remain of the current system um, around which your propo proposed reforms can be built. So is there a particular core of our current system that should remain? I mean, if so, what uh, would you identify that core as? <clears throat> well, I guess part of my answer would be given in, you know, what I say about what a prison is. So it's a, a I'm assuming that there will be involuntary institutional confinement under custodial care. Um, that that practice will have it has legitimate uses, not only in in the case of law enforcement, but in, in other domains as well. So uh, certainly that practice would have some use, though scaled down dramatically in terms of how extensive um, issues in the criminal justice sphere. Um, you know, I, I'm, I think it's critically important, um, to embrace due process and, you know, when people, when the community charges someone at violating its, its rules, um, it's a, it's a serious charge and people, but, but people should be equipped to, um, defend themselves against that charge and the burden of proof should be on the community that's, that's making the allegations. And I think that there structurally we we do have a lot of these elements in place um, to uh, 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 the elements of due process in place, uh, but their practice, you know, in a, in, a, in a sort of wildly inconsistent and often biased way. Um, so you, you, if you could get personnel that wasn't biased, racist to perform those, the roles of carrying out the due, press, due process dimensions of a criminal justice system, I think that that would be, be worthwhile. So I wouldn't be opposed to things like the burden of proof, to access to jury trials, to, um, to appeals, and, and so on. I think these are important elements in any democratic society to, to, to have those elements. There are others, but those will be among the ones I would want to sustain. 
thanks for asking your question, George. Um, the next up is Leo. Leo, would you like to ask your question now? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, Tommy, thank you uh, for, for the work that you do and the perspective that you bring. Um, as a self-styled restorative abolitionist, um, I believe in restorative justice, transformative justice as a pathway towards prison abolition, probably in the future beyond what I'm going to be able to see. And so I engage with people a lot in radical visioning. Right, of envisioning what kind of future we want to see. And so you've referenced um, taking less harmful approaches to creating solutions. And so what might happen if you changed that framework from less harmful to a more healing approach, um, a more understanding approach, a more community-based approach um, to interrupting cycles of interpersonal and systemic harm? So, I mean, uh, in thinking about healing, so I, I can think of two dimensions. So one one dimension is um, healing to the person who's been harmed because of some wrongdoing. Um, there's like, there's that. And then there's a healing that could be thought of as a repair to a relationship that's now been broken or or, or damaged. So and I, I take it that some, some people who favor sort of justice um, favor both. That is that they they want both for um, people to recover from the harms that have been wrongly imposed on them, uh, but they also sometimes want um, uh, the, a, a relationship that's now been um, broken or become one of um, enemies to for that to be to to uh, uh, to be reshaped by the actions of those who are harmed and those who've done. The wrongdoing, and I think those are um, uh, important, vital goals. I don't know that the criminal justice system is is going to do much for that second. I don't think it's it's not really designed to do that. I don't think it's probably likely to help much in any way with healing relationships that have been torn because of serious wrongdoing. Um, and there I would be inclined to think that you need other, more community-based, other uh, ways of responding to the problem that isn't a matter of what you can get from the criminal legal system. Um, but I think that the criminal legal system can sometimes be helpful, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with re re repairing harm insofar as it calls for reparation or restitution. And I think even more importantly, um, that its, its role, if I'm right, should be uh, to prevent the wrong to begin with, um, to play a role in trying to prevent the, 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 the harm, the harm, so that you don't need to resort to these modes of repair that I think are often appropriate. So Thank if you. I could, uh, just follow up real, real quick, sorry. Um, so as somebody who is currently 15 years into a 50 year sentence, who is also a restorative justice practitioner and in relationship with a number of victim survivors. Um, what I've found is that the criminal legal system does not care for victims. Um, the restitution that is called for is not paid. Victims often have to re-victimize themselves in order to have access to their just due because the current criminal legal system actually separates and prevents reparative action. And it's like there, there's a bill right now in New York um, that's working to dismantle some of these barriers and it's still waiting on the governor's signature, but there are very real systemic barriers that prevent healing for victim survivors um, rather than uh, supports it. And so restorative justice seeks to create healing holistically uh, for primarily the person who has been harmed, but also for the person who caused the harm by creating opportunities to heal collectively and bring the community in for collective accountability, to take responsibility for co-creating the conditions within which the interpersonal harm happened. Um, so I'll hop out and say thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for that. 
So Tommy, can I give you two more questions to ask and then we'll let you go. You're, yes. you're already over time. So I'm gonna have to pay you time and a half at this point, but <laughs> um, but th there are some great questions in the chat. So I was hoping that you can get to them. Um, one is by our own Katie. Katie, maybe you wanna ask your question yourself, um, please. Sure, I'll be brief. Um, thank you so much for the discussion today. I really appreciate it. We often see comparisons to prisons in largely racially homogenous European Nordic countries and thinking about more humane prison conditions. But, you know, given especially your many, many years of research and thinking about uh, racial hierarchy and kind of punitive power and carceral settings in the U.S., what do you think is the realistic prospect for importing or recreating that notion of humane prisons in a U.S. context? Um, well, you know, when it comes to trying to achieve racial justice in the U.S., I mean, it's hard for anybody to be super optimistic. I mean, you know, you uh, it's it's. It's it's been a long struggle and, and, and it's a ton of ton of work to do. I mean, I certainly wouldn't, you know, I so I agree that, you know, it's a comparison to, you know, Norway or Denmark or so or some places might probably not that helpful on this front of dealing with this problem of the of, of racial justice. And maybe the, the more appropriate comparison would be to a place like Germany. Um, which is is considerably more diverse than um, the, the Nordic countries, um, but also has really low rates of imprisonment and much lower crime, and uh, and a rehabilitative um, ethos in in its prisons. So it might be a, a better comparison, uh, uh, which you know because they're you know you're looking at you know, last time I looked at numbers and they're still around, you know certainly under eighty prisoners per hundred per hundred thousand people where, you know, we're, you know, North, I looked at our numbers recently, but I mean, at least we're North of 600. Um, so it's a dramatic difference uh, in a very pluralist society um, uh, with what might put the point this way, pretty serious <laughs> problems of, of racial injustice and in it's, and it's past. So it may, it, you know, you, 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 you look for some hope and, and in, in that, that it can that these kinds of changes could be could be brought about, but I don't see, you know, how you could do it without pr pretty serious uh, transformation in the economic sphere. You just I think you just have to have considerably less inequality and considerably less poverty than we have. And I think that will go a long way. Um, even towards healing some of the the racial rifts that can, that that we continue to to see, I think it's just essential. It's just it's hard to do. Um, whether it's criminal justice or broader social justice, these are very difficult things to to bring about. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Final question. I promise you, Tommy. And this is from Samuel. Samuel, do you want to um, unmute and ask uh, Tommy the final question of the night? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, my question is basically whether you have any concerns about an, a historicism in relation to the project. Um, so I'm coming from philosophy as well, so I have a lot of sympathy, and I was really excited by this being a philosoph philosoph philosophical treatment of these issues. Um, my sense, though, and I found this, uh, to be honest, a, a, a bit um, frustrating in reading the book, is that a lot of these arguments come down to a sense that while prisons aren't currently able to do X or Y that you really hope they could, which would be dramatically different from our current world, um, in theory, something called prisons could eventually do that. And there's no reason why, uh, therefore, we should be abolitionists instead of reformists. The problem with that to me is that um, it's kind of fundamentally ahistorical and is underselling the degree to which for the entirety of American history, um, racial caste, racial injustice, racial inequity has been caught up with prisons and policing. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts on that issue to me. Also, uh, the other thing I was mentioning here that I think is really important uh, from my perspective is you're, it, it seems as if in the book you're acting as if there's a burden of proof on abolitionists to sort of demonstrate like th that their alternative will be better um, as opposed to thinking because of the history of the U.S., there's a burden of proof on reformists to show that from the actual historical moment we're living in, things are going to change um, in the near or even the kind of not the near future. Yeah, thanks. Let me take a crack. <laughs> um, well, 
I, mean, I certainly think, you know, the, the history of a place can give you a lot of insight into, um, you know, what will work and what won't and what's, and, um, and maybe even some insight into what's, what's possible, but I just don't think that it can fix what's possible, that what's, what's happened in the past. Um, it doesn't, so, you know, you try to learn from, uh, the past, but part of, you know, having a kind of general commitment to, to, to trying to bring about just conditions is, uh, um, to thinking that you can, um, bring about conditions that don't, that don't resemble the past that we've, we've known. I don't know that that makes it a historical, uh, I certainly think that there are, I, mean, I try to emphasize the ways in which, you know, I mean, my singular obsession is the race class nexus throughout all of my work. And like that, the ways in which racial and economic justice kind of just structure things and make it so difficult to do anything. Um, but I think we also have seen, uh, you know, improvement in, in both domains, sometimes with, you know, two steps forward, one back, sometimes one forward, two back. <laughs> um, so I don't know that I would, I don't think of it as a historical. I mean, I, I think, unless you think, I mean, I, I, you know, that we're so, that the U.S. is so special um, that you, you because you you can look, there's just a, a lot of societies with just much lower rates of crime, there's much lower incarceration, like dramatically lower. Unless you think we're like so special that somehow racial injustice is like such a, a uh, you know, irreparable force in our lives, then I, I don't know why one couldn't, why one wouldn't think that you might be able to, under some conditions, maybe not in our lifetime, um, be able to make the kinds of changes that more resemble these other places. I just don't, it's hard for me to see it. There are people who think that. There are people who 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 do think that it's kind of like a a, a break, a metaphysical break or something has happened and it's just like totally irreparable. But I don't know that that is a point in favor of abolition because presumably the same problem arises, right? That is, um, if it's so difficult to reform the prisons so that they're more like in other places where they're much more humane, you know, why would it be easier to abolish them? Uh, it is not clear to me that that would be a more feasible project. So I don't know that the the weight of, of the history of, of injustice really cuts in favor of, of abolition against against reform. Well, thank you so much, Samuel. Um, Sam, it looks like you want to kind of- but I'm sure I he has. He's a philosopher. Here. He's always got three follow-ups. <laughs> way too many. Yeah, don't go to other I'm going to trust that you will do that. Tommy, I can't thank you enough for an amazing conversation. Um, a really thought-provoking book. I, I tell you the central questions I'm going they're going to be in my head for some time to come. So so appreciate the book and really appreciate you joining us and really kind of uh, tackling these questions that we have. Um, it really did add to our conversation. So thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.